Hello, everyone, and welcome to my favorite time of the year. It is that time, once again, to review the films of my favorite film festival localized to my state. The Eastern Oregon Film Festival 2020 has had its difficulties trying to get made because, well, we live in a pandemic, and uh, unlike other years where you can get physical badges... This year, I had to make my own, actually. I made my own. Uh, not a lot of people did this. Uh, I was noticing not a lot of people made their own badges. Uh, but recently, I found out they started making badges for filmmakers and other people to be sent out to the people who bought the passes. So, you know. And much like many of the film festivals I have been seeing around lately... All the films are online, so the film festival this year is online, which is a bit of a different shakeup, but it does allow me to cover as many films in a day as I want, and it allows me to space out the amount of time I film for each day of this whole video that I am making here. So what I'm going to do for this video is that today I've actually watched three of the 13 entries for the feature film category. I've already watched three and the rest of the films will be covered in day increments. So we're going to have segments for day one, day two, day three, day four. Um, and uh, and then it's all going to be put out in one big video. And that's it. So without any further ado, let's cover day one stuff. The first film of day one that I watched was The Lure of This Land, done by Alexandria Lexton. It follows her journey into Belize, a small Central American country, and it covers a lot of ground as to what the Belize people are, uh, what their geography is, what their culture is, uh, various environmentalist sort of stuff, and I'd say this is a pretty much by-the-numbers documentary for the most part, it's a documentary that covers its basis pretty well in terms of what kind of culture is represented in Belize, what kind of lifestyle people have, the kind of general vibe the people give, give off, the local environment for which the Belize people are surrounded by, and other such things that are important to the Belize people, such as uh, how the Mennonites, you know, go about their business or even uh how the zoo first starts in belize it's pretty interesting actually and out of the film they follow various different people throughout the film but they do make it primarily largely about a couple of the different subjects one being a wildlife photographer and documentarian and another one being a zookeeper there was like a rastafarian chef at one point there's various other different people but I think my favorite segments are always with the ones with the zookeeper in the film. Uh, having her talk about the way certain animals were viewed to the Belize people were actually kind of interesting. Like how they thought that the barn owl is actually a symbol for death and famine and whatnot. And it's actually kind of interesting to view that way because I'm a big fan of barn owls and... I don't know, just kind of weird. But on its whole, the lure of this land is kind of a paint-by-numbers documentary. You can kind of tell where it's going, and to be honest, even though this is the shortest film of the festival at only 67 minutes long, I still kind of found myself going, maybe this should have been a little shorter. Because there are certain sections of this film where I felt like it could have been shorter. Uh, and I do have one little nitpick about this film, and it's not necessarily something that's going against the film, but it is something that I kind of was a little annoyed by. There's these little sections that kind of go between the different uh, subjects of the documentary, these little spacers where the author of the film, Alexandria, does this little like voiceover section, and every so often on the screen it would have like little words to emphasize certain words that she says. The actual like voiceover actually communicates a lot in terms of what it's trying to communicate in terms of themes or uh the general vibe it's going for without having to utilize like random words across the screen to emphasize certain words that you're saying it's just kind of weird but the rest of the film is actually pretty decent it's shot pretty well for a documentary shot on a very low budget it's a film that it, it's okay I think it's okay, and I'm going to give it a B-.
Revolution Laundriette is a Japanese film, and all I could say is I'm a little bit confused by it, because this film is about this kid who kind of wanders through life. He doesn't really know what he wants to do, but then he comes across this book that has these little newspaper scratchings, and throughout the film he has to, like, try to find threads between the book and life. It, it's kind of weird, and they, there's certain times in this movie where, you know, they cut to this, like, German philosopher guy, and he's talking about, like, standing in a circle, going in circles, meandering a lot, and it just, to me, it fe feels like it adds padding to a film that already feels like it's meandering, and you don't really need to talk about walking around in circles all the time. It just feels like it's padding on top of padding. It just doesn't feel like it's all there and a lot of the text of the film is just kind of flat out talked about leaving not a lot of room for interpretation until the very end of the film where the end of the film just kind of goes in this weird direction for a punchline I guess and I'm just gonna leave it up to you guys if you want to watch the film because this film is just weird I do think the film's editing is kind of interesting I think the art style for what the uh, what the filmmaker tries to go for here is pretty interesting, um, and it has a unique sound to it at times, but there's so many weird things that I honestly need to watch it maybe a second time or a third time to really understand what's going on here. Um, I also did find it kind of odd that not only do we get subtitles for Jap for the Japanese characters, which is, you know, typical for, you know, international film right but here we also get subtitles for the english speaking words which i kind of found odd uh not sure what the whole purpose of that was but i don't know it's just kind of there I, I don't know all in all i did find revolution laundry mat to be an interesting little obscursion but not a big film for me to be like i would recommend it I'm going to give Revolution Laundriette a C minus. The world will be different. And the last film I saw for day one is Blood Moon. Blood Moon is directed by Vikram Dawan. I'm not entirely sure how to pronounce that name. I hope I didn't, like, fudge it up. If I did, just don't burn me in the comments for this one. Blood Moon follows a guy who returns to his hometown and tries to reconnect with various people he meets along the way inside of this town he used to grow up in, coming across old acquaintances, colleagues, relatives, etc. And this movie meanders. This is a this is honestly the most boring film I've seen so far of this festival. I think this is hands down not my favorite movie. Like, this isn't fun to make fun of, and it's not entertaining enough to make fun of it. It's just boring. Think of think of various So Bad It's Good movies, but make it boring. This is pretty boring. It's very similar to Revolution Laundriette in the sense that it's going for this vibe about the main character kind of lost in everything. But the main difference here is that the main character in Revolution was actually a little bit charismatic and kind of interesting to follow at times. Whereas in this movie, he's just a blank slate. Everything about this movie feels like it has no stakes. It has no character build. Everything is just kind of said and postulated in a very nonchalantly bland manner. Like something that is less emotional than something that Christopher Nolan would do like th this is this is very emotionless and even the color palette oozes this sort of unliving quality to it and there are certain things about this movie that I'm still not entirely sure of is the main character dreaming is he dead is everyone dead I have no idea and the film makes no attempt whatsoever to kind of like leave certain clues out there okay that's a lie there's maybe one or two clues out there but all in all it doesn't necessarily point to anything concrete it's just a very lifeless blobular type of film that has so much padding in it, it, it i just can't get through it 
And another thing, too, is that this film also has some really obvious audio issues. There's times when the audio for, like, say, breathing through your nose is really loud. It's very noticeable early on. And it gets better throughout the film. It's not as consistent. I'd say the audio quality is very inconsistent because at the beginning, this person's using a lot of S type of sounds, like S, you know, that kind of thing. But the S is so sharp and so blunt that it hurts your ears when you're wearing headphones. And it does hurt speakers when you're listening to it. And at times, there are certain sounds that are so hot that you just kind of wonder, wonder to yourself... Did anyone go over the audio map for this film? I'm not entirely sure how to really feel about the bad audio in this movie. And there's even times when, like, the audio is so muffled. And there are obvious lines where, like, it feels like it's 80 yard But overall, the audio is just, at times, unbearable to listen to. But at other times, it's kind of passable. But this movie also has a lack of story and a lack of direction. Yes, you get a general premise that this guy is back in town, but why exactly is he back in town? We don't really get a sense of who this character is, what he's actually wanting in this movie. He's just very randomly walking around a town, and that's it. There's nothing until, like, maybe the last third of the movie, the last 20 minutes or so, where he's like, oh yeah, I forgot, this person exists, and then spends the rest of the time with this character, and it amounts to nothing. A story without certain stakes or any character building or character movement just kind of left me very bored. I understand that this this film might appeal to a very film snobbish type of thing, and count count me in for being a film snob. I like like films like Phantom Thread and, you know... (laughs) Other, other such artistic masterpieces, such as Shape of Water and even Thunder Road and The Wolf of Snow Hollow. But this film just takes this sort of pretentious route and just kind of shoves away anything about character building, character depth, character motivation. Everything about this film just feels like it's just so devoid of a skeletal structure. It feels like the blob. That's what it is. And I'm going to give this film a D+. This is day two of the Eastern Oregon Film Festival. And uh, here's my reactions to today's films I watched, starting with... Everything's the same. Till it's not. Ten Minutes to Midnight is Eric Blomquist's second film at the Eastern Oregon Film Festival that I've seen. I'm not sure if he had some before or even some intermittently, but this is Eric Blomquist's second movie at the film festival. The last time he was at this film festival was in 2018 with Long Lost, which I enjoyed. And if you want more clarification on that, go view my video for the 2018 Eastern Oregon Film Festival. And this time around, 10 Minutes to Midnight stars Carolyn Williams, best known for Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, as she plays Amy, a radio disc jockey for the radio show 10 Minutes to Midnight. And upon her arrival at the radio station, she gets bit by a rabid bat. Basically, what happens next is a bunch of weird, horrific type of stuff involving vampires. This movie is a little bit unconventional in certain ways, but it is a film that I feel in part is a reaction to things like the Me Too movement. There's various things in this movie that has like the boss of the radio station be in a position of power, and basically he (laughs) he uses his power to uh, basically gain sexual favors. This movie goes in a lot of balls-to-the-wall directions, and it is a film that pretty much says, hey, you know, these people that are, you know, not supportive of the claims that people are having, yeah, they, they deserve to die. Essentially, that's kind of what I got out of the movie. Maybe that wasn't the, inten- the intention here, but that's kind of what I got. Carolyn Williams in this film is phenomenal. She is the lead of the film, and she does a pretty good job trying to discern 
what is real, what isn't, because of the bite that she has on her neck. She's kind of losing it a little bit. And pe some people think that she is getting rabies. She's thinking that she's in a dream or something like that. It's a film that has horror elements to it, and you would think that from the trailer alone it would be primarily about vampires, and I wouldn't necessarily it's fully about vampires until, like, towards the middle, towards the very end. It's a very odd film. Uh, it's still really good. There's still some really... It's good in cinematography. It's good in acting. It's good in gore effects, for the most part. There is, like, one weird, creepy effect towards one point in the film... Where, like, this guy's face is just all... Bleh, bleh. It was weird. I don't know how best to describe it, to be honest. But it's pretty good. Overall, 10 Minutes to Midnight is a pretty solid horror comedy drama type of film. I think it's a really fun film to watch if you have seen Long Lost. Again, I don't think it's bad. I don't think it's as good as Long Lost. But I do think it's still good enough. It's still good. And I'm going to give 10 Minutes to Midnight a B-. minus. From My River with Love is basically kind of a documentary slash art piece. If I get that correct. From what I got from this film, a lot of it is just a lot of stationary, voyeuristic type of shots of families across the entire country of America... At certain situations at a river and essentially what this is is that it's an art piece about how we're all connected by our shared interest in relaxing uh in vacationing in like cool water streams in the river that's kind of what i get here and it's not bad i would say again there's not much of a story here so if you are looking for a story you're not going to get it. It's a movie that's primarily focused on giving people a sense of atmosphere, a sense of community because of the various people that the film documents. It's not a film that has like interviews or talking heads. It's just a documentary that's basically there to be like, yeah, take it all in. And the cinematography also works in that favor because of the voyeuristic nature of a lot of the shots, as well as the crisp clarity of all the different types of shots that the film uses. It's actually really breathtaking at times to watch. But this movie is not necessarily a film I would recommend to just, you know, f people that just want to watch a film. This is a film that might make you fall asleep unfortunately, but I still think it's pretty good, despite the lack of a story or characters, you know, it's still something that you could watch uh, just to relax. It's a very relaxing movie, and you can take it in, and that's what it's used for. And I'm going to give From My River With Love a B. Freeland is directed by Mario Furioni and Kate McLean. It follows Devi, played by Krisha Fairchild, and various assistants in Nebraska. And what happens is that weed becomes legalized in Nebraska, and she finds that it's becoming very, very hard to run her business, considering the fact that various distributors are saying that, hey, you know, maybe we shouldn't have illegal pot as our main uh, source of supply. This movie is a pretty interesting movie. I do think the acting here is good. I think the cinematography is pretty good at times. There's some shots in here that don't necessarily feel too professional, but a majority of the movie feels like it's really good. Um, and this is a movie that is primarily a tour de force performance by Christina. I think the thing that is really interesting about this movie is how it comments about the growing state of acceptance about weed and how some people have viewed uh, making weed for a long time and having to try to transition into this new mode. And it's something that is highlighted in this movie. It's something that is told about this movie. The very fact that she can't get buyers for her pot because it's, you know, illegally done. She doesn't have connections to the FDA or anything like that. You know, it's not, you know, it's not, you know, legally sourced, she's finding it hard and harder and harder to stay free because she doesn't want to have regulations. She makes some of the best strains of weed in her state of Nebraska. But because of the fact that, 
you know, she has to try to fit in with society. She just can't figure that out. And I think that's pretty interesting. I wonder if there would was something like, you know, something like this in the Prohibition era, where you had people who uh, made illegal liquor, illegal whiskey, moonshine, and whatnot, and then they legalize it again, and it, some people may, might have found it hard to transition into that sort of mode. And that is something that this film exemplifies. I don't really have much else to say about this movie. I don't think it's anything too particularly interesting or or big. Uh, but I do think it's actually a pretty decent movie to check out. It's one of the better films at this festival. And I'm going to give Freeland a B+. Anyone who has a Ukrainian connection can't stay indifferent right now. The last movie I saw today is The Long Breakup, and I think this is hands down one of the best films of the festival so far. The Long Breakup follows Kata Soldek as she documents her time as a Ukrainian-American, as she learns about the situation in her home country of Ukraine, and the annexing of Crimea, and the various other things that happen uh, that have happened before the, the fall of the Iron Curtain, and how it leads up to the events in Ukraine in 2014 and in 2018, and the ongoing struggle of Ukraine. I think this is a really timely documentary, not because, not just because of the fact that this is an event that's still going on. It's a very timely documentary in the sense that in the world of global issues, there's a lot of revolutions that are going on now. I think the voiceovers here are really good. The personal messaging here is strong because of the fact that it's a autobiography of sorts, and it's uh, about this person's struggle with the fact that it's primarily about this person's struggle with the fact that Russia wants to continually try to take over Ukraine, it's her home country, um, and it's essentially a film meant to document and preserve culture. And that's what I really appreciate about this film so much. And for that, I'm going to give it an A-. Alright, it's day three, and now it's time for me to discuss the films I watched today, starting with... I Blame Society is a very interesting movie because it's a mockumentary style movie that is a horror comedy that follows an aspiring filmmaker. She has not had a lot of success recently with um, a lot of business deals that keep sliding through, and she decides to document her time trying to become a murderer based off of the comments that one of her old acquaintances gave her about being a successful murderer, saying that, oh, she would be good at being a successful murderer, and she puts it to the test in this film. And this is a very interesting movie, because it reminds me so much about Behind the Mask, The Rise of Leslie Vernon. If you don't know what that is, it's a movie where we follow Leslie Vernon. Uh, it's basically set in the world where all the movie slashers that we've come to know, like Freddy Krueger and, and Michael Myers... They're all in the same universe, and he tries to become, you know, a slasher himself, a slasher legend. In the same similar vein as that, I Blame Society is kind of in that same boat, but it's not necessarily for aspirational reasons. It's more or less a sort of film about filmmaking, and the stresses that comes from filmmaking. The fact that uh, indie filmmakers regular, uh, regularly don't get a lot of uh, huge attention when it comes to filmmaking, especially female directors. And this is where uh, the film has a pretty damn good commentary about um, how even in the world of murderers, people assume that the, the person that's murdering all these people is a man, when in fact the person that we're following in the film is a woman, and it's a pretty big commentary on that. You know, when we do live in a world where a lot of the murderers that we have are men, such as the Golden State Killer or Ed Gein and all those, you know, sadistic people, uh, it does come down to that. And it also has this an interesting commentary, too, about indie filmmakers, 
because on the regular, you don't see a lot of indie filmmakers get a lot of credit. It's usually the bigger studio type films or films that have big executives behind them. And I feel like in some way this was written in frustration because of that whole thing. Having to go as far as to make a film about a person who would literally commit murder in order to impress producers. And it's pretty interesting. There's a huge payoff scene towards the very end of the film based off of that assumption. And I feel like that is where this film really lies. It's a film that is based in the frustrations of the modern Hollywood system, I feel at least. Uh, I'm not too sure if that would be the expression given by the director of the film, who is also the actor and the writer of the entirety of the piece. So... <laughs> There, I mean, it's you're not wrong. This is a film that's pretty brutally honest, but it's also really funny. There's various scenes in this film that are played up for laughs, and it is kind of funny. It is funny at times, but it also has that underlying kernel of truth, the sad truth of the matter of women in Hollywood, women filmmakers, uh, women in society, and how it's all either underplayed or people try to play to it but come off as condescending. Uh, there's a scene early on where uh, the person meets with a producer who's trying to be an ally but kind of comes off as condescending, like having to be like, oh yeah, well, you know, I mean, we need someone like you to be that, to be the voice of that. You know, we need, we need that. Um, I don't know. It's pretty interesting, to be honest. And I think I Blame Society is one of my favorite films of the festival because of it. And I'm going to give I Blame Society an A-. A Life's Work is a pretty decent documentary, I would say. The documentary itself follows four different types of people who are having projects that will outlast them, meaning that these projects will never be done in their lifetime, but could be continued by other people, either by descendants or other workers that work in the same field. We follow people who scan for extraterrestrial life. We follow a person who's trying to build his own society, uh, but is growing older. We follow a family of people who's been planting and farming trees for generations, uh, and we follow various other people in this documentary. And I'd say it's about as interesting as watching those things. It's not a particularly impressive documentary, but I'd also say it's pretty interesting for the most part. It's not terrible. It, it's still produced well. But I did find overall there is some audio issues towards the beginning. Either Either it's because of the stream quality that I had, or it was something that was wrong because there was audio sync issues with the mouse. Like, I could tell that there was audio, but, you know, the mouths are moving, but the audio is not there. And then the audio picks up uh, before, you know, before and after those things. And it's just, you know, the audio is not quite the best. But I'd say this film is still good overall after that point. Uh, again, still has some audio syncing issues, at least what I found. Uh, it's not particularly the, the best, but it is something interesting to watch um, and try to think about uh, what your contribution to society, what you want to do for yourself and for society is going to be, uh, and try to think of, of things that would possibly outlast you as a legacy. It's pretty interesting, and I'm going to give this film a B+. Plus. And last but not least, we're going to talk about Harry Sepka's Raph. Raph follows, well, Raph, played by Grace Glowicki, a fun, free-spirited, low-income, two-job-having type of person. And she meets Talia, a rich, affluent, uh, very aff affirmative type of person, and they form a friendship. And over time, we see the effects of how both of them affect each other and the way class is influenced in those relationships. This is a very good drama. I think this is one of the better dramas I've seen this year because what happens in this movie is very class conscious. The reason why I say this is a class conscious film is the way the two characters are characterized in the film. Roth is a person who is working two different jobs, lives in almost poverty, 
but she is about to be evicted. But she still finds time to be herself. There's various scenes in this film where she dances by herself, and she's free-loving free in of herself. But she's not the most confident at the start of the movie, and by the end, she learns to gain confidence from this person who takes advantage of her, uh, and then ends up, you know, doing what she does. I can't spoil it. Um, Talia is kind of a different sort of person. While she is confident in herself, and while she is, well, comparatively more rich, more affluent, the problem becomes is that because she's so rich and affluent, because she's secluded from society, the fact that she finds this person... Uh, Raf, because she finds Raf interesting, she kind of uses her as her own sort of bit of entertainment. And it isn't until the last 20 minutes where, you know, shit really hits the fan in this case, and the big truth kind of comes out. And it is kind of depressing in some ways. But it is also kind of a commentary about how the rich in any country try to find some value of entertainment in finding people who are low in the society totem pole and uh, and tries to have some entertainment with it. And there's parts of this movie where Talia, as, long, as well as her friends, start, quote-unquote, interviewing all these people that Roth is associated with. There's these sequences where uh, Talia is interviewing, like, her friends and going with these very odd questions at times. And it's just so weird. It does come off as kind of weird. This could also have been somewhat of a horror movie as well, um, if it were to have gone that route. But it is a well-done drama, and I think the acting here is really good. Especially by Grace, who plays Roth very, very well. As a free-spirited person who's not necessarily the most confident in herself, but she could be comfortable in her own skin. Um, and I really enjoyed her performance in this movie. It's really good. So I'm going to give Roth an A. Alright. I'm going to drink some water. Today is Sunday, October 25th, 2020. The last day of the Eastern Oregon Film Festival type reviews for this whole video. And uh, let's finish things off by starting off with this film, A Dim Valley. A Dim Valley is written and directed by Brandon Colvin and is about a bunch of eco-researchers who are in the middle of the mountains in the Appalachians when a group of mysterious hitchhikers slash backpackers arrive at their doorstep and they end up changing things for mysterious reasons. This is a very interesting film because it's not necessarily a fast-paced film. It's very atmospheric with the way it's trying to encapsulate everything inside of this forest that they're all in, inside of most of the movie. Uh, this is a film that is pretty big on LGBT themes, especially towards the very end of the film. Um, I don't really have much to say about this film. It didn't really leave me with a big sense of impress impressment, or uh, it didn't really leave me with a sense of wanting to talk about it afterwards. It's a pretty decent film. It's shot well. The audio is pretty good. The story is okay. Uh, there is a weird thing with like these mystical women that show up, which are the backpackers in the film, that have some sort of like magic abilities I guess it's not necessarily explained but I do think it's kind of a maybe a metaphor for the forest or the wilderness I'm not entirely sure how best to describe uh the uh the the three characters in the film um I don't really have much else to say there's nothing really um too impressive about it but it's also something that I'd probably recommend it's pretty good that's all I can really say, and I'm going to give this film a B plus. Our track record leaves very little confidence that we have a future. Last Call for Tomorrow is a documentary about climate change, and if you've been watching the news for the past year, you would know that there have been various instances of climate change, 
various instances of forest fires, especially where I live, uh, various um, <laughs> various volcanoes erupting, the ice sheets are melting, and this whole documentary is pretty haunting because from the start of the film, they basically say, if we don't do anything now to mitigate it, we're going to face the worst. But I think the unfortunate thing about this documentary is that the whole issue of climate change is so politicized to the point where no one can talk about it scientifically to anyone that's outside of the bounds who has like a different opinion on co climate change, like people who believe that it's not real uh, or anything like that. I think the question really becomes of this documentary, it's not, it's not, are we too late? It's, has this movie been released too late? And that's what I think this film really is. I agree with the message. I agree with the central message of the film. However, again, we've come so far into the whole political landscape for climate change that everyone has an opinion on climate change. And unfortunately, there's a lot of people that don't really seem to have any predilection to changing their mind on the issue that is at hand. People are just so set in their individual like paths that they don't really see the wider picture of what's happening with their decisions or how corporations are the biggest contributor to global climate change, such as meat farms, oil industry, various other different things. Last Call for Tomorrow is a pretty decently done documentary when all is said and done. There are some title cards that don't look the best in terms of professionality or even uh, some inter interviews as audio doesn't necessarily sound so crisp, but for the most part, it's well put together. It's a film that honestly probably could have been shortened a little bit, maybe to an hour 20 uh, instead of an hour 30. But it is a film that is well done, is timely of the issues that we are currently having, and it is pretty good. It's well done. And I'm going to give Last Call for Tomorrow a B-. minus. And the last film I saw of the entire festival is the Turkish independent film Toprak. Toprak follows Burek, who lives on a farm with his grandmother and uncle in poverty. He wants to go to university, but when his grandmother falls ill, it's up to both of them to make tough decisions. This is a pretty good film, and I'd say pretty good. It's not great. There's some issues I have with it towards the very end of the film, but for the most part, this is a pretty well-done film in terms of how it depicts poverty, the effects of poverty, the decisions that are made in the film, done by both the uncle and Burick, are pretty impactful to the overall narrative, uh, more especially to the uncle, who, spoilers, uh, at, at one point, he has to sell his kidney in order to pay for medical bills and expenses for the grandmother who had been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Uh, but that decision carries on throughout the entirety of the film. And it's something that's kind of disguised from the main character of the, of the piece until the very end. Which is something that kind of irks me, but can also be seen as a critique of toxic masculinity or not letting other people into your life. I don't know. It, it could be seen as one of those things. But it's also a film that examines poverty in various other different lenses. For example, on the religious angle, we see that um, the uncle is testing his faith. The faith is tested by the fact that he had to do so many different things in this movie to try to get back on top of things. But unfortunately for him, Everything just kind of goes by the wayside, and it just shows that, you know, the level of strength needed to have faith in trying times like this, like the one that the uncle and Burek are in, is pretty astronomical. It's pretty big. But I'd say one of the things that keeps this movie really together is the way it portrays poverty as a... It pretty much humanizes people who are in poverty. It doesn't look upon them as, as downtrodden. It doesn't look upon them in a sense of condescension. It's just a matter of fact. You know, they humanize the characters. They make them likable. 
Um, and the situation that they're in feels very realistic to what some people would go through in poverty. And there's a lot of honesty to the film, too. How the relationship between the uncle and Burick are portrayed as well. There's just so, there's such a level of honesty about how the situation is portrayed that makes me really recommend the film. Overall, I think Toprick is a pretty well done movie. It's shot well, edited well, acted well, scripted well. The themes of poverty and religion and various other things are pretty much evident in it. But there is kind of something that is sour towards the end that it really depends on who you are as a viewer. And I'm just going to leave it at that. So I'm going to give Toprick a B+. And that'll do it for Eastern Oregon Film Festival 2020. This year has been very different in terms of how I was able to watch the films. I was actually able to watch every single feature film this year, which is surprising because in years past, I've either had to skip one or even two of the movies that were being presented. Here, because I have so much time dedicated to all the films, I was able to complete all the films. And I was really ecstatic about it. And this is probably one of the longer videos of the Eastern Oregon Film Festival coverage that I've done so far. So, uh, yeah. Hopefully next year we'll be able to get together in person at the Liberty Theater in La Grande or do whatever next year. I just hope next year is a better year for this festival because this is a really fun festival for me. I love to talk about films that aren't talked about by major media outlets all the time. I just love it. And so uh, I'll leave it all to you guys. I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace. Peace.